Uh, let's bring in famed short seller. This is our headliner for this evening. Mm. Jim Chanos, founder of Chanos and Company. Jim, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Thanks so much for joining us. Welcome to my hood. I know, <laughs> your new hood, or not relative, uh, relatively new, I guess. 20 years. Tw oh, 20 years. I didn't realize yeah, that long. Yeah. Um, what do you make of this this memo, this notion that, that we could be at war with China? It, it feels like people don't want to believe it or don't believe it. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, uh, the war in the Pacific is serious stuff. I mean, let's not forget we have a land war in Europe going on right now. I mean, a, you know, sort of a World War II, tanks, artillery, things we haven't really seen in, in, in our lifetimes. And uh, so a shooting war in, in the Pacific, you know, all bets are off. I mean, I, I certainly hope that doesn't happen. And um, But, yeah, I mean, it, it, it upsets everything because of what Guy said. I mean, whether it's supply chains... Um, whatever. I mean, we, having having China go to war with the West would be just apocalyptic. How does that factor in, if at all, uh, to your view on China and how you view that market in terms of opportunities for you? Yeah. Um, well, obviously, our, our view on China, which is now 12 years old, I mean, has been based on the financial system and the debt and real estate markets over there. And uh, not a whole lot changes. Obviously, China will become more insular. Um, I've been watching the, the China reopening trade like everybody else has for the last six or nine months um, and uh, sort of marveling at it. Um, but I don't think there's any way to handicap it from my perspective as a hedge fund manager. I mean, again, if it, if it happens, it's, uh, it, it, the unintended consequences will be severe. Jim, do you think, though, you know, going forward, we're just seeing, you know, the, I guess the, um, you know, the situation with Russia and Ukraine was simple. U.S. multinationals had to take a stand about the, uh, the Russian aggression. It's a little different with China. When you think about our reliance from a manufacturing standpoint, our U.S. multinationals' interest in that emerging middle class, which has been a part of the bull case for 20 years now in China, how would that play out? Because I really feel like that could change the dynamic for a lot of U.S. companies. Yeah, I mean, I, again, I, I think that, that we're far more intertwined into the Asian economies, in particular China. And, and so uh, anything that, that would end that and bring this into a, a Cold War, much less a, a shooting war, um, I mean, just has to, be, ha, has to be just a major, major event for not only markets, but geopolitics. I mean, it's, yeah, scary stuff. Jim, we talked about multiples of this market, expensive, not expensive. I mean... 30,000 feet. What are your thoughts? I mean, again, that don't fight the Fed mantra that's been out there. For some reason, people want to look past it when it doesn't sort of line up with the market going higher yeah. for them. Um, well, I think, you know, we we don't try to time the market. Um, but like anybody else, I have opinions and things are not cheap. I mean, I, uh, they're not as expensive as they were, say, a year and a half ago. Um, on the other hand, uh, the market is at 18 times forward. Um, profit margins are all-time all highs, so that has not mean reverted. And one of the most mean reverting time series in all of economics and finance is corporate profitability. And it's been stubbornly good and, and high. Um, but since I've been on the street in 1980, not one bear market has ever traded above 9 to 14 times the previous peak earnings. So whether it's 87, 89, 90, 94, uh, 2002, uh, or 09, um, if you think earnings are peaking now give at $200, um, that's a long way down, right? That's 1800 to 2800 um, We're not anywhere near that. And, uh, and so you have to hope earnings hold up, um, and you have to hope—I mean, look— Right now, the market in the, in the space of really six, seven months has gone to corporate profits are going to be up 12 percent this year. Inflation's coming down to 2 percent. The Fed may be easing at the end of the year. I mean, that's pretty much nirvana if you're a bull. Uh, that's, but that's what markets actually forward pricing think right now. Uh, they're wrong all the time. But people are pricing in a pretty, pretty nice Goldilocks scenario. Are you trading the markets directionally overall, or is it just individual? No, I mean, we, in our hedge fund, we are slightly net short, slightly net long. Um, and, and so until recently, we were actually slightly net long. I think we've gone to, to back down to zero line, plus or minus. Um, and in our short-only funds, we're 60 to 80 percent. 
Um, and so it just depends on the individual names in those. And, and we try not to take a lot of systematic market risk in our hedge fund. A lot changes, though, when you go from 0% interest rates to what could be 5%. It yeah. can certainly accelerate the fundamental stories you bet against um, when you do your deep fundamental analysis. So I'm wondering, are there, are there positions you think look even better now because that environment changes? Maybe the debt service is too heavy a burden, et cetera? Well, one of the areas I'm, I'm marveling that has held up as well as it has, with, with a couple of exceptions in subsectors like office, has been commercial real estate. Um, I just don't get people buying almost any kind of, of, of commercial real estate that is that, that doesn't see good demand at this point at 3%, 4%, 5% so-called cap rates. It makes no sense. You know, SL Green, which we are short, New York offices, have uh, been short now for a couple of years, trades at a 5% cap rate, and it's levered massively to its cash flow. Um, and... I just don't want to buy New York office buildings right now at, at, at a 5% cap when the balance sheet is leveraged 15 to 1. It just makes it, And I mean, and there's all kinds of stories like this out there in the commercial real estate. Um, as you know, we're, we're short the data centers, which I think is one of the worst businesses I've ever seen. Um, they traded 100 times earnings. And, and, and earnings are the metric because CapEx equals depreciation. And so there's just all sorts of odd anomalies in the valuation space of things that are just in the stratosphere still that sort of make no sense to us. Yeah, sometimes things look cheap and they're actually more expensive than like the Intel quarter, for example, was a disaster in that world. Debt ceiling and you know, politics are boring. We don't really talk about them. And I'm not suggesting we're going to go down 2011 path when U.S. debt got downgraded. But it's clear that there's a faction of people that want to push the envelope on this. Is that something that concerns you, or we just sort of slide through this like we typically do? No, I mean, again, it's another black, that would be a kind of another black swan that no one thinks will happen, including me. Um, I, I mean, just when push comes to shove, I think we're going to pay the interest on our debt. Um, but who knows? It could be wrong. Really? <laughs> yes, That's yes. Not... Um, you're still short, correct? We are short. Yep. Um, but you trade around that position. We correct? do. It's been bigger and smaller, and, uh, and and but we are still short. What is the what is the fundament? What is the thesis now? Um, so what I would, would I point out is, is what I mentioned uh, today on social media, which is it's it's interesting is what the bull case has done. The bear case has been pretty consistent. That the competition was coming in, margins would have to come in, sales would slow from the torrid pace. What I'm more amused by is how the bulls have effortlessly shifted from, in October, uh, this is the only company still growing 40 or 50 percent, and you can pay 60 times earnings, uh, four dollars last year in October. The stock was 240 dollars. Um, now that earnings estimates have come in hard for 2023, up 10 percent, four dollars 40 cents versus four dollars. Now the narrative seems to be, well, yeah, there's a price war going on, but the legacy auto guys are going to be hurt a lot more than Tesla is. Okay. But that just shows you that the auto business is a tough business, right? It's, if you've got to cut price as well as raise price for ebbing supply and demand, you're in the auto business. You're in a cyclical business. And his margins, which peaked out in the high 20s, gross margins, are now heading, we think, into the high teens, where they were before they opened China. Everybody forgets, Tesla lost money through 2019 building cars in the United States. It wasn't until they opened Shanghai and that ramped in a major way that their margins took off. And China right now is their weakest market. Um, so he's, you know, they're wrestling with some issues. And, and the stock is still at almost $550 billion market cap is trading now at 20 sometimes gross profits. It trades at a premium. I looked before I got here. It actually trades at a premium in terms of its multiples to Ferrari and Porsche. Wow. But does it tell you something, at, I don't know, about the mentality of the of the Tesla's stockholder that the earnings have been reported, that it is known now that their margins are going to decline by a lot, um, and the stock still went higher on the back of the earnings. And, by the way, Ford has said that we have to cut the price of the Mach-E because of Tesla, that the competition is getting to the point where they have to follow what Tesla is doing. I mean, isn't this a case of Tesla trying to just gain share? And so in the long run, they're better off because they'll have the volume and their margins will be better. 
Melissa, can I introduce you to some other stocks in my portfolio in the last three weeks that are up more than Tesla, that are going bankrupt? <laughs> I mean, it's been an insane three or four weeks, much like August, July, August. And so you've had stocks like Carvana, Triple. Uh, you've had Beyond Meat, which we think runs out of money this year, uh, up 40 percent, 50 percent. I mean, Tesla's not alone. It, it, so, Jim, let's talk about Tesla in China, OK, because yep. we know that they have this great market share here in the U.S. And I think Melissa just mentioned that Mustang Mach-E price cut. They're making those cars in Detroit here, OK? Mm -hmm. But the cars that Tesla are making in China, they have less than 10 percent market share over there. And a lot of these local manufacturers are obviously doing much better. And I see no reason for that to change. Throw in what we just talked about, this, this geopolitical potential. Our situation with China is not getting any better, yeah. but yet he's placing more and more emphasis on that market from a manufacturing standpoint, from access to rare materials for their batteries, and then also the demand for the cars. It just seems like pretty obvious to me that this is going to be, this only gets worse before it gets better in China for them. Well, Dan, I mean, you know, I've been saying kind of half tongue in cheek that Tesla is a Chinese car company, and, and it really is. Um, it, the, the bulk of its production is there, and we think almost all its profits are generated there. And so you have all kinds of risks now in light of our earlier discussion about the warnings. But on top of that, uh, you have repatriation of capital risk. You have BYD and others just taking massive market share. And Tesla trades at a premium to those companies who are growing faster than they are in, in China. So if you want to play all these things, there are now lots of ways to do it. If you want to play the growth of EVs in China, you can buy BYD, you can buy NEO, you can buy Lee. Do you own I mean, BYD? No. Um, we own the S&P and, and, and the NASDAQ. Um, I don't think it's in the NASDAQ. So if it's in the NASDAQ, we own it. But um, I, I just think that, that it's, it's really the choices now are increasing. And the bears were wrong on competition. It took a long time to show up. But I don't think they're wrong now. I think it, the competition is growing and, and it's here. Let's play the trade around it game. Traded down to 101 and change, rallied 75% or so since. Carter Worth last week said mm -hmm. the stock is going to trade up to 175, yeah. middle of that downtrend and fail. It's sort of doing that today. You're trading around it. Where's the ultimate level for this thing to get to a point where you say, you know what, that's it. I've, I've got enough. This is my level. Well, I mean, so again, the street estimates have come down dramatically. So street estimates for this year were $6. They're now four and change. We think the number has a two in front of it this year. And, and so then the question will be, will investors say, gee, this is cyclical? I mean, uh, earnings were cut in half. Um, and what kind of multiple? I think it'll always trade at a premium over the intermediate term to other OEMs. But I don't think it should trade at 5x premium to the other OEMs. And that's where it is. I mean, it, again, the other OEMs trade at three to five times gross profits. Tesla's trading at over 20 times gross profits. And, and so and the magnitude of the, the valuation discrepancy is enormous here. Uh, and I think that's, at some point, that's going to close dramatically. Now, is it $40, $60? I mean, I don't know. We'll have to see. But I don't think it's 170 Is there anything that you think maybe I don't get this part of the Tesla story or this is the, the one wild card? that could happen that would cause me to rethink my short. I mean, you've been short, a short, a directional short for a long time. The position size changes mm -hmm. over time, but yeah. but is there something that, that sort of gnaws at you? <laughs> yeah, well, uh, yeah. I mean, it's something gnawed at me for for better part of four or five years. <laughs> uh, the stock was flat for five years and then took off. Um, Why didn't you cut your short? Then? We did. We did. We did. did. Yeah. Were you completely out of that no, short at the time? No, I don't think. I don't think we've ever been completely out. But okay. we we vary positions from half of one percent to five percent. That five percent is our limit, and things rarely get over four for us. Where are you so now? when people people talk to us about a Tesla, whatever, uh -huh. they always mistakenly assume it's our only position. Right? There's one of forty three names in our portfolio. So I mean, we have we have a few other ideas. Um, right now, it's kind of in the middle of that that range. Um, but I, I told, uh, I debated, uh, I debated a noted Tesla bull yes. uh, a, a week and a half ago. And I, I, th I, I stand by what I said. I think if Tesla were to show reacceleration of earnings, I think we would rethink our position. Like to, you know, suddenly 450 became five and six and seven again. Um, I think their profits are going to be under pressure, and I think it's going to be relatively permanent. I don't think they're going to be earning. 
28, 30% gross margins. I think it's too competitive a market at this point. They're too big. Um, they've been successful, right, but law of large numbers. And now they're having to go down market to get more share and, and more volume. And that puts them right square in, you know, with, with the Japanese, German, and U.S. auto manufacturers. Right. All right, we've got 42 other names to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> Jim's going to stick around for one more block. We'll also talk. We're back with named short seller Jim Chanos, founder of Chanos & Company. We spent a lot of time on Tesla, but you are short and long other things. You referenced the meme stock mania, and you are actually long one. And sh- Wait, well, we're long I, and short, kind of I the know. same one. Yeah. yeah. Walk me through that trade. That's yeah. fascinating. So uh, we, uh, we are long the uh, AMC preferred, uh, the so-called APE shares, APE. And uh, we've been bearish on the common for a long time since the post-meme stock run-up. And Adam Aaron, to his credit, is trying to raise capital, which I think he's, he's doing the right thing for the company. Um, and they realized they, had this, they realized this loophole last August where they could issue preferred shares. They couldn't issue any more common. The shareholders wouldn't let them uh, issue any more common. They found kind of a backdoor around that, and then they did a big private placement uh, with a private investor who agreed to vote shares on behalf of converting these. So what's going to happen is going to be a shareholder vote in March. They filed the document on Friday night, and... Uh, the preferred shareholders can vote. The common shareholders can vote. We think there's enough votes to force conversion. And so one ape will become one share of AMC. And they're still trading at about $3 difference. It's a, it's a classic arbitrage. I didn't know there was math in Miami, but apparently there is. <laughs> but I'll ask you this question. So go to 30,000 feet. And what does it say about the state of the market when you can see names like that move 100% yeah. one day? and 100% the next day. Does that mean we're closer to bottom in the middle of this whole thing? What does it say to you? Well, since the first quarter of 2021, which I keep saying was the most speculative market I've seen in my lifetime, um, the meme stocks, the SPACs, I mean, the, the NFTs, crypto, um, every time the meme stocks have, have taken off, it's been the end of the rally, not the beginning of the rally. Huh. And that goes back to January of 2021, uh, there was a, a, a similar rally in June, July of 2021, another one in, in the fall. And then we had one in March, April of 2022. We had a big one in July, August, mini one in November, October, November, and, and we just had a big one in January. Um, and every time the retail comes back into these names to squeeze the shorts or you know do whatever they're going to do, um, it's a pretty good sign that, that, that people have lost their fear. And they're buying near bankrupt companies or companies like this and restructuring. I, I, Bed Bath and Beyond is a wonderful example. I mean, that that ran earlier this month, and uh, their bonds are trading. I think now at four cents on the dollar. Four cents. Yeah. So if you really thought Bed Bath and Beyond was going to turn around and become a great company again, you would have a 25 bagger by buying the bonds, mm-hmm. and nobody wants them. Right. But the stock they love. That makes no sense. What is the environment like um, with rising interest rates, with, with the market decline that you're forecasting or expecting to be a short seller? And I'm asking you, I guess, this uh, in the context of um, Hindenburg Research issuing its report on Adani Group. Yeah. And that stock in India just wiping out tens of billions of dollars in market cap over the span of just a few trading days. And um, I, in, in context of what? Maybe uh, refine your question a little bit. People are really listening to short sellers these yeah, days. Yeah, I mean, well, 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 I mean, Hindenburg is a, is, is a is a very unique example. They do phenomenal work, and the the Adani report was 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 amazing. I read it over the weekend, and um, and so you know, we like other investors when they when they put something out, we we rush to read it. Um, but look, I mean, this is kind of this has been an eternal struggle between the bulls and the bears. And, and short sellers continue to be vilified. I mean, just get on social media. And, and, and so many stocks have a rationale for ownership because of the short position. And I just keep warning people, please don't buy worthless pieces of paper because someone has a different opinion than you. Right? Do the work and, and, and understand what these stocks might be worth as companies before you just say, oh, it's got a big short position. I'm going to buy it. It's not a great reason. 
So, Jim, you just mentioned over the last two years now that when you've seen some of the stuff, the sort of activity that we're seeing right now, um, you know, happen, the exuberance, it's kind of meant the end of this rally. We're 15 or so percent off of those October lows. We've seen a massive rotation over this period since those lows into financials, into industrials, yeah. into, you know, some other groups. And, and, and mega cap tech has underperformed. But to me, if I look at like a Caterpillar or if I look at like a JP Morgan, you know, like I see valuations that may, might make Mug. a whole heck of a lot of sense given what I think is going to happen yeah. to the economy. So are those presenting some interesting yeah, shorting they opportunities? Are. I mean, in fact, we talk about the meme stocks and Tesla and people like to talk about it. But we have far more core positions, Melissa, in what I would call massively overvalued, crummy, well-known businesses where the returns on capital are terrible or cyclical and people have bid them up into the stratosphere. I, I'm, we're marveling at General Electric at 40 to 50 times earnings. General Electric. I mean, I, you know, it, it's gone through restructuring. They spun off health care at the end of the year, and estimates have just kept coming down. And now the estimates for this year are $1.60 to $2. That's on an adjusted basis. And I point out that, that GE puts out one of the most hysterical earnings press releases. There's like 18 pages of adjustments. Um, so the adjusted, adjusted, adjusted is a buck sixty to two dollars. Was two dollars and forty cents a few weeks ago. Stocks at eighty one. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, I, this is GE. You know, it's a cyclical company. Often trades at ten to fifteen times earnings. It's at forty to fifty times. And and there are other names like that. I, I don't want to go into. Dan and I were talking about some of them. You know, companies where where earnings are going to be down meaningfully this year and flat from 2018, 2019, trading at 40 times, 45 times. Um, so there's a lot of pockets of silliness. They're just not in some of the names that were silly in 2021. Those have come down so much. But they're nonetheless, for what these companies are, they're pretty pricey. Jim, it's been a pleasure. Thanks so much for coming by. Thanks for allowing us into your neighborhood. <laughs> you guys should come by anytime. <laughs>